Thanks uh, very much, Ian. So good morning, everyone. Great. I think uh, Francis and Harry were right. This guy has a way with words, right? So I almost wondered who, who is that. And uh, my wish, I don't know where you were when I was getting married. I would have had you introduce me to my mother-in-law. <laughs> Maybe the bride price would have gone down, right? Or will it have gone up? I don't know. Anyway, um, so good morning, everyone. So my name is um, Anthony Muyoro. As you've heard, um, currently I serve as the president and chairman of uh, Isaka Kenya Chapter. And this is a professional association that we, um, of course, help professionals um, build capacity um, in areas of ICT, um, cyber security, um, IT risk, IT audit, as well as governance. I also wear another hat where I, I, I am the uh, current director for cyber security and privacy. Um, for KPMG across East Africa. So um, I'm very privileged uh, to be hosting this amazing, amazing, interesting session. Um, and I want to introduce my great panelists. And these are people that I respect and highly regard, particularly in this area. We're going to be talking about um, effective ways of and how to implement um, zero trust um, security, right? And what are some of the approaches and how is this, um, how can we adopt this model? So without further ado, allow me to introduce my panelists. I'm going to start with Geoffrey Munga. Uh, Geoffrey Munga is a cybersecurity senior manager at Safaricom PLC. Karibu sana, Geoffrey. Um, a round of applause for him. My second panelist is Said Rashad, who is the Regional Sales Director for Palo Alto. Welcome very much, Said. Karibu sana. I hope you've learned Swahili. Uh, pole pole. Pole pole. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, my third panelist is none other but Jerry Mugwire. Jerry is the head of ICT security and um, governance uh, for Mayfair CIB. Welcome very much, Jerry. And last but not least, and he's a personal friend of mine, this is none other but Eric Miner. Eric Miner is the modern place um, specialist as well as security specialist for Microsoft. Karibu sana, welcome. So we also collaborate uh, with Bona Eric here. Um, so gentlemen, welcome to this uh, panel. I'll first of all give you an opportunity to introduce yourselves, and maybe we can start from my extreme right. Said, tell us more about what you, uh, what you do, who you are, and um, the organization you represent. I'm getting old, and thanks for putting a picture of 15 years ago. <laughs> so, um, first of all, Asante uh, Sana for giving us this opportunity to be with you here. And uh, I am Saeed Rishad. I happen to be um, living in Kenya for about five years. And when I learned really to love this country, love the culture, and, and so forth. I've been in the industry of IT about uh, more than 32 years as a CIO for oil and gas, and then with Cisco, and moved to EMC, and now with Palo Alto Networks. Next venture for me be Pharma, so I retire, just for your information. <laughs> and uh, where I don't need zero trust. <laughs> Excellent. Thank, thank you. you. Jerim? Uh, thank you, Anthony. My name is Jerim Maguire, or Maguire if you went to a group of schools. Just make sure you spell the name right on the check. Um, I have been heading ICT security in uh, different banks, Tier 1, Tier 2, and most recently Tier 3. And uh, with uh, some leg moving into the full IT stack. Yeah, I think I'll leave it at that for today. Excellent, excellent. Eric. Right. Um, thanks. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Eric. I've been at Microsoft about eight years. I currently cover security within a region called MCC, which is our multi-country cluster, which is about uh, 65 countries. Um, we work very closely with our partner ecosystem uh, to try and deliver Microsoft value through uh, our partners. Thank you. Amazing. Sure. Yes. Uh, good morning, everyone. So I'm Geoffrey Munga. I'm currently the senior manager for cybersecurity, strategy, and design uh, in Safaricom. And I've been uh, doing cybersecurity for the past uh, 15 years. Thank you. Excellent. So thank you very much, gentlemen. So this is going to be a conversation, right? Uh, because we want to go into the, uh, the mechanics of what zero trust is all about, right? And 
course, we know that um, particularly with the ex ex accelerated um, adoption and migration to cloud, as well as this hybrid new ways of working, um, you know, as an industry, we've had to rethink cybersecurity and um, security, particularly of how we protect and fortify the enterprise. And this is where zero trust security comes in. And I want us to, first of all, just to demystify this. Um, say, tell us, why is this important? And why should we discuss this at this point in time? OK, thanks for the opportunity. But before coming to the concept of zero trust, um, I think humanity today is entering a new phase, and nobody's talking to, about it in the real term. Because if you look at the timeline, we, be, we know everything about you know, BC before Christ and Annus Dominus. And everything that has to do with humanity, but like the agriculture revolution, then the Industrial Revolution, we're talking about now the fourth Industrial Revolution. But to us, the way I see it is BC is before COVID, and then PC is post-COVID, which is basically I called now, we enter as a humanity in the pandemic revolution, is a PR. It's not more about industry, it's not about anything. It's our, our life now is being impacted deeply. Many of us have lost close friends in, 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 in less than, one year and a half, we were even banned to visit our parents because of that trust has gone. The human trust has completely gone. Mm -hmm. But what also come with the COVID is that kind of great proliferation of digital. So we've been shifting to digital capabilities. Our way of living now become more digital. Mm -hmm. We communicate with our dearest people in our life digitally. You agree with me? Yeah. Right? At the same time, we've seen also a, a starking and really disturbing amount in increase of attacks. So why zero trust is so important? The answer is six. You know what six means? Last year only, the cost of the cyber pirates, or I call them the cyber vampires, has taken from the global economy six trillion dollars. If you put this in perspective, that is the third largest economy in the world after the US and China. If you put that money back in, our, in, in humanity, that's more than 10 times the cost of the COVID per se to humanity. So the zero trust is not about I have an option to do it or not. If you as an IT or a CIO or CISO not thinking about building that kind of culture of zero trust. And the only way we can do it, I believe in one big saying is that, you know, knowledge is the mother of empathy. Or awareness is the mother of empathy. And we have, we have a challenge as IT guys to make sure our board, you know, they know about cybersecurity in person and everything. But how really they are empathizing with us, how really they really measure that kind of challenge, that's what we need to work on as, 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 as a key players, as a catalyst. You know, so it, it, zero trust, it needs a village. You take a village to make it happen. It's not about ecosystem, it's about the ecosystem. Right? Today, let me put it in perspective as Palo Alto has been, been known, you know, known as the leader in cybersecurity. But to simplify things, right? Uh, every organization here have more than 30 or 40 cybersecurity solutions in the ecosystem, right? But to simplify things, the way I've seen, we've seen uh, the cybersecurity has two main letters, D and R. Detect and then the response. And, and the resiliency of any cybersecurity posture you put in place in this journey, there are two main factors that really can dictate whether you are resilient from one hand, and you are anti-fragile from the other, right? Resiliency is, is measured by your mean time to detect an attack when it's happened to your in environment. And the anti-fragility, it's defined by your mean time to respond. The longest this time is, you are less resilient and, less, uh, and more fragile. This fastest, you are the more resilient and more anti-fragile. But to achieve this, you need what I call A, automation. Because 
the cyber crimes, they have so many, to, you know, to take six trillion dollars in less than one year to, from the economy, because they have lots of automation, lots of, sorry. Yeah, yeah, go on. You agree, mm -hmm. you agree with me? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and in fact, we wanted to also get to that, particularly when we're talking about now how this now technology ideally will be looking at, right? Yes. But I wanted to also ask uh, Bona Eric, because this is one of the areas I know you've also been looking at, yeah. and we've had extensive conversations on the same, yeah. uh, and particularly even from a layman perspective, because we have the traditional security, as we've known it, right? And now there's this shift, there's this transformation um, to now zero trust model. What is the main distinction and how does this now come together? Now, plugging into what he just mentioned as well. So, is, you're asking what makes zero trust so unique as a, as a security model? Yes, and how is it distinct from the traditional model that we've had? Okay, I think from my perspective, I would look at very two key points. Number one is the world in which we are in today, right? Um, you look at remote working, not only as a result of COVID and the pandemic, as uh, Said has mentioned, but also of how just organizations work. They need to work from different locations. Um, they need to share data across uh, different parties, whether those are internal or external parties. Uh, the advent of shadow IT, um, I had someone, I, had, I think Haida mentioned about it earlier, you know, teams using their own applications, non-sanctioned non applications within, within the organization. Um, you have devices that are being used um, and a proliferation of them, whether they are mobile devices, you know, BYOD devices, um, you have IoT devices accessing corporate data. So with all that and the technology that comes with that, um, cloud security, you have organizations storing their data in the cloud. How do you protect, how do you shift your mindset from a traditional network security uh, perimeter um, to a more of a zero trust uh, model, right? Uh, and so the other thing, the other trend that I see is the way you perceive threats, and I think Said has mentioned to it, is traditionally you thought that threats are coming from outside, but now you have a lot of insider threats, threats within the organization. So when those threats are already there, then the security, the network security perimeter becomes almost irrelevant because the threats are already inside the organization. So how do you protect for that, right? Uh, and so a lo as a lot of organizations, you know, Palo Alto, the rest, focus on zero trust. Um, Microsoft is also investing heavily in that model um, across identities, uh, everything we're doing with uh, privileged access uh, management. Uh, we have a notion of conditional access, right? So how do you access, um, how do you govern sign-in risk from remote locations? How do you judge the risk of that session, of a user session? Um, we look at data and how you classify and protect that data, uh, regardless of where it moves. Um, you look at the network, how do you segment the network and isolate? Uh, you look at devices, how do you uh, protect those devices, ensure that they're healthy and compliant? Um, so traditionally, different solution stacks have served um, customers um, as a part of Zero Trust. What we're trying to do is give you a single stack, you know, um, our E5 platform, uh, moving directly to Azure um, to protect you better, you know, as a, as a proposition to, to Zero Trust. And so what I hear from you, um it's not really um, a one tool, no. one tool, one solution approach to um, addressing that challenge, no. right? No. But it takes uh, a combination of different um, flavors of tools that can do different things. And I want to ask Jerem, because Jerem, I know uh, as a practitioner, um, and particularly being a CISO for a bank, this is something that, of course, um, you know, it's at the fore of what you guys are doing. From where you sit, how does that ecosystem, that combination of tools come together? What are some of the technologies that you're able also just to, uh, maybe just explain to us in a way that we can understand? How do all this come together? You really did it, yeah? Uh, Anthony just asked me to play God in a room <laughs> full of believers and religion. And I'll try to be very fair because I'm not paid by any one of them. I'm an end user, that's what I mean. Yes. Um, but what I'll say is that uh, the day before yesterday, I was at another summit hosted by Oracle. They're not here. They were talking about cloud, hybrid cloud, and the buzzword was zero trust. Yesterday, our keynote speaker, Microsoft, discussed zero trust. Mm. Darvesh from Symantec, uh, Broadcom, talked about zero trust. Uh, who else? Palo Alto, there was... Uh, uh, a presentation that was given yesterday, just before lunch, 
and it was zero trust. HPE gave us Aruba uh, network here and uh, the buzzword was zero trust. So when did trust come from 100 to zero? That is the question and that is what is asking me of all those guys talking about zero trust, who is the most faithful? Uh, I'll be very fair, I'll take us back. Uh, there's a small presentation that will summarize it for us. And uh, what I would say is that uh, just like uh, all my colleagues have said, zero trust is a collaboration for collective defense. All ye religious people and faithful people are all light. You're on the right path. It just depends with us. So what I would say is that zero trust is not a point product. You cannot go to your board and tell them that I want to buy zero trust. That's one. Number two, zero trust is not a standard. It's not yet standardized. It's just a collection of best practices that our research and design, techn technical research and design have put together uh, to help end users like us to achieve what has now become our digital transformation. It's no longer working from home. We are working from everywhere. We just say we are working from home in the office, but some of you are on holiday, some of you are in the car. You know, we are now working from everywhere. So it's a collection of best practices. And these best practices are geared towards protecting your six digital states that are projected. You can see them. Number one is on the identity of your people. And when I talk about identity, you have internal identities, your employees. And you also have external identities within your organizations. And when I talk about external identities, you have your customers. For instance, in the bank, we have people who are doing internet and online banking. We have people who are doing mobile banking. When they log in, how do I separate them from my vendors who are sitting within the bank and the vendors who are also working from home? So, and all these three categories, the employees, the customers, and the vendors, they are all using different devices, as has been said by my predecessor. And the devices, also depend with which environment you are in. Uh, I'll not mention a name, but when COVID struck, I know a bank, a small tiny microfinance that sent people home to go and work from home, but they didn't have laptops. But you, you have to, you know, you have to contain the measures. The government has said, implement this. It was more of a, a regulation kind of thing. So what do you do? I am in IT, I have a laptop, so I'm at home. Assuming my spouse is one of the members in that bank, but she needs to attend a meeting, whose laptop is she going to use? Obviously mine, right? Yeah. Work has to continue. And our kids were home with us too. Digital learning, remote. It's time for a class. We only have one machine. Where will I log my son or daughter? On my own laptop. It's coming home now, right? So it's one device. It's not trusted by my organization, but work has to continue. So the question here was, what tools? As you're seeing me moving with my talk, you're seeing that there are several challenges, and with every challenge, there'll be a tool for it. That's why I'm saying all of you faithfuls are right. Mm. Whatever you believe in is right. Mm. Uh, there are pieces that we protect and run and manage from our offices. There are laptops that we manage from our offices. There are those who are working from their personal devices. How do I separate my office official document from your private uh, WhatsApp and Instagram data, all right? And in the event of a breach, how do I get to contain it? How do I get to secure my data? I wouldn't give you a point product, but you know you need, if you look at my six digital states, you need endpoint protection. And the endpoint protectors are within the room and some of them are having the booth out. So I'll play God today. I'm not mentioning them. Mm. Then the data, I've just talked about data. How do you not mix your private data with your son's and your spouse's data? You have encryption, yes, it encrypts your company corporate data, but how do you not mix your work files when you download them into your device or even on the cloud? Because some people already went to the cloud. Hybrid, what we've been discussing since yesterday. And uh, data we, have, we also discussed at length is the new gold. And uh, if the data is on the cloud, uh, we, someone talked about a presentation today in the morning about containerization and uh, virtual machines. Now. Uh, do we just connect them directly because now we're in the office and we have VPNs? Introduces another tool, CASB, Cloud Access Broker. I don't know who is offering them, but that is the solution you need between your cloud and your premise. I'll not call your name. <laughs> but yes, 
the, we have the vendors who are playing in that space. Now, if you walk to Microsoft, for example, and ask for a zero trust security uh, protection, they have a list of 15 things you need to buy. Or maybe five. Or maybe five. Or maybe five. <laughs> <laughs> if you walk to Palo Alto, they'll give you a list of another 10 things that you need to buy. Okay. I'll not mention them. Mm. But if you looked at my presentation, all you need are the different six layers. You need identity protection. You need endpoint protection. Okay. You need to protect your data. You need to protect your applications. You need to cover your infrastructure and network. Okay. That summarizes the tools you need at Excellent. different levels. Okay. Thank you. Excellent summary. Thank you very much, Arim. And I now want to turn to my brother, Geoffrey Munga. Now, for an organization that is, is, uh, wants to embark on this journey, I was reading a report by Microsoft, interestingly. They say that um, around 92% of, of organizations and even decision makers um, are thinking about this, this adoption, right? And it's important we steer clear of the obvious challenges. And I know this is a journey that you guys have taken as an organization. So um, what are some of those challenges that you're aware of and how can organizations uh, be able to navigate through them? Maybe briefly. Okay, I think, um, first of all, um, I'd want to say that zero trust is not really a new concept, actually. Mm. It started way back in uh, maybe 2009, 2010. Yeah. And there's a guy called John Kindervak. I'm not sure I've pronounced it correctly, but he's the one who came up with the first uh, proper definition of zero trust, yeah? And uh, he recommended um, a five-step approach, basically, to implementing zero trust. And uh, that's an approach that I my, myself would recommend. So the first step is, first of all, is to define your protect surface, or in other words, define what you really need to protect, yeah? And you can look at it at, at, at four levels. So there's the people or the identities that you need to protect. So you need to think, is it your custom identities you want to protect? Is it your employees? Is it the admins with privileged access? Is it your contractors? Is it your third parties? And then the next thing you need to think about is uh, the devices. Yeah, how are you going to protect your devices? Yeah, whether it's your workstations, your servers, uh, your mobile devices, even IoT devices. And then the other thing you need to think about is how, how are you going to protect, for example, your applications and services? Yeah, and you need to identify which are these critical applications and services that you want to, 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 to protect. And then lastly is about the data, yeah? And especially now with the advent of Kenya, the Kenya Data Protection Act and the GDPR, data is very, very important. You need to think about how you're going to protect it. So, that the, so the first step is to define your scope. And, and I recommend is don't take on too much. Maybe identify the, the top three critical assets that you have in your company. If you're a bank, maybe it's your core banking system. If you're a telco like us, maybe it's your core billing system or your ERP. So I define what your scope will be. That's the first step. Then the second step now is to map the communication flow between these assets, yeah? You need to know which application is talking to which application, yeah? And depending on how complex your network uh, is, you, may, you can make use of the, the data uh, mapping flow tools to help you identify that. So once you've identified the communication flows, then the third step is to uh, design and architect now your zero, net, uh, zero trust network, yeah? And uh, you can do it at four levels. So there's the, 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 at the network level, you need to think about how you're going to segment your network. And uh, you, know, you can just start with three simple you know, segments. You can have like a high restricted network that maybe has your most critical assets like your ERP or your core banking system. Then you can have a restricted network that maybe is, uh, has your all applications that are accessed by all employees within your organization. And then you can have like your unrestricted or public uh, uh, network that maybe has, uh, that anyone can access out there, like your customers. Then once you've, uh, you've, you've defined that, then the next thing is how you think about how you're going to protect the, the identities, the people who are going to access that uh, restricted, those uh, restricted uh, network. And that's when you start thinking about how are you going to enforce strong authentication? Maybe you, here's where you think about multi-factor authentication. You can think about um, even uh, using passwordless authentication, especially uh, in, th in this day and age where people are struggling with remembering so many passwords. So all this will help. 
And then um, the, the, the third step is now um, basically um, enforcing the zero trust policies. And, you, and for that, uh, John Kidwell actually uh, recommended using the Kipling method, where you ask yourself who, what, where, when, and how do they need to access. And then the last step, of course, is monitoring and maintaining uh, uh, the, your, the security. Yeah? And maybe one more step I would recommend is maybe also orchestrating and automating these things. Because again, uh, once you implement zero trust, it's very easy for someone to make a human error. So if you can orchestrate and, and automate as much as possible, then that will make it uh, much easier. Yeah. Thank you. Amazing. Thank yeah. you so much. I think that's very, very clear. And ladies and gentlemen, I think, I think for this topic we need um, like three or four hours. But allow me to start wrapping up this session because, I mean, it's uh, very, very insightful what the gentlemen have ideally shared. Uh, so I want to take one or two questions uh, from the audience. And the first question from Natin Satish is, how does existing company policy or culture affect the implementation or deployment of Zero Trust journeys in timely and efficient sprints? You want to take it? Okay. I'll take that one. Um, organization culture greatly affect uh, the implementation of zero trust. As I said, uh, and uh, as was introduced by Said when he was talking, zero trust is a journey. It's a strategy. It's not a point product. And uh, you cannot start today and say, I want to have zero trust by tomorrow. You must have started. You, you have some product. At least you have the basics of a network, the parameter firewall. And then now next, uh, most people implemented VPNs when the, the pandemic hit, but that was just a direct, it was open for everyone. The same VPN that an IT technician had was the same with an operations person. So uh, for the sake of uh, knitting, I would say organization culture and policy greatly affects the implementation of zero trust, because we said uh, the different point products that you have will determine uh, how you protect all the six categories, the micro segmentations that I had uh, presented earlier. Another key thing, again, that most organizations like uh, end users we suffer is budget. Because we've mentioned protect your data, have identity and access, orchestrate, monitor, automate, all these things come to budget. So if you don't have that budget within your IT uh, or your uh, board are not IT savvy. You don't know uh, how to explain to them these things in a non-technical manner. Okay. Then you might not be able to achieve. All right. Yep. Excellent. Wow. Amazing. Ladies and gentlemen, um, that's our time. Um, I don't know if there's any last question, but I can see there's none. So I think I'll wind up. Uh, but thank you very much, gentlemen, uh, for just uh, sharing amazing information. Um, and I'm sure, um, you know, for them, uh, for you guys who are here still around, guys can still interact with you, uh, particularly just to respond to some of those questions. So thank you very much. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being an engaged audience. I know we are standing between tea breaks, so we'll just end the session. Uh, wishing you guys a fantastic, fantastic weekend. Asante Nisana, and God bless. Bye-bye.